Good evening. Once again, it is good to see each of you, and what a blessing it is. I uh, once again apologize for the losses I have and the extra uh, pauses I may make. Well, they might make some happy as I slow down just a little bit, I guess you could say. Uh, I wish this voice I had, this radio voice, would stick around, but I'm sure it will uh, go away. My high voice will be back and the crackling and things of that nature. But it's always good for that singing there. I can get that bass a little bit better sometimes with it. We are going to continue and look at what we've been examining in the prison epistles from Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And as we've been going through this series of lessons on the prison epistles, <coughs> We've looked at and examined the glorious church of Christ from the book of Ephesians. We've looked at the joy that's in Christ from the book of Philippians. And we began looking at, over the last few weeks, the glorious Christ of the church, having last week examined the preeminent Christ from Colossians chapter 1. And that brings us in our text to Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 through 29, where Paul enlisting the things in which he is involved with, the things in which he, a servant of the Lord, a minister of Christ, one who has given greatly to God, demonstrates the superior Savior's sacrificial services that are demanded of him. And when we look at that, and when we examine that which we find there in our preeminent Christ and his expectations of Paul and us by example, through him. We see and we look and we notice the great importance that Paul places on these sacrificial services that he has. So if you have your Bible, let's go ahead and look and read Colossians chapter 1, 24 through 29. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for all ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of, his mystery, of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil or labor, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. When we look at this and when we see this, we can see from this passage, this section of Scripture, where our preeminent Savior demands certain sacrificial service from Paul. And when we really break down what is demanded of Paul, we see as a reality demanded of us. Jesus' sacrificial service demanded, as we look at our first point, in Paul's suffering, didn't it? Paul said, listen, I suffered for Christ." And when we think of suffering, the righteous will always deal with persecution, won't they? Paul being in prison at this very moment, the prison epistles. His first imprisonment there in Rome, as we read in Acts 28. Paul dealing with this imprisonment, this suffering, is that which he proclaimed, but is which we know everyone will deal with. Suffering for Christ isn't a matter of if is it? I think we mentioned it last week or last Wednesday. It's a matter of when. And Paul understood this perfectly, considering he was, like I said, in prison. He was dealing with the ramifications of teaching Christ. In Colossians again, let's read verse 24 of chapter 1. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Again, Paul knew suffering. We have to go no further than to look at 2 Corinthians where he lists a great deal of things in which he suffered for Christ's sake. Whether it be the beatings in which he did, the floggings and scourgings three times. He received 39 lashes. The shipwrecks, 
the imprisonments, all the things that Paul suffered. Paul knew suffering. He knew persecution. He said, listen, I rejoice in my sufferings, though, because he knew it was inevitable for those that strove for righteousness' sake. Of course, as we mentioned before, Paul told Timothy this in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And we know why godliness produces suffering. As is said by Jesus in John 3, 19 through 20, listen, the darkness hates the light. They can't stand it. The light exposes them. But the question really isn't whether or not we will be persecuted. That's a given. Paul doesn't say, listen, I don't know why I'm being persecuted. He references this persecution in light of rejoicing, though. Why was Paul rejoicing in his suffering for the sake of the brethren in Colossae? That's really the question we need to ask when it comes to suffering. What's going on here? What do we see? Let's look again there at Colossians 1.24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Why was Paul suffering for them? How was that the case? How did Paul find himself suffering for a group of people remember as we talked about before he has actually never met it was Epaphras who informed him of the church in Colossae and the surrounding congregations in which he had been Epaphras preaching and teaching and had seemingly been the one to uh, teach those in Colossae so why is it Paul saying listen I'm in prison for you I'm in prison for the church in Colossae <coughs> You see, Paul understood that when the brethren see a faithful brother or sister sacrificially serving, it emboldens them to produce in their lives the proclamation of the gospel without fear. I'm reminded again of what Paul would write to the church in Philippi, if we remember back in Philippians 1.14. And most of the brothers, having become noticed this, confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul said, listen, the suffering that I'm going through, that which God demands of me because those who live godly lives will suffer persecution. The suffering I'm going through is that which I do for your sake. I go through this, I rejoice in my suffering, knowing that you are emboldened by the things in which I suffer. Sacrificial service to our Lord demands suffering on our part. It not only matures us, but emboldens those around us who see it and witness it. As we see with Paul, Jesus required that of him, and it gave strength to those who would go through persecution themselves to be bold and strong. If Paul could handle this, if Paul could do this, if Paul would continue to preach the truth, continue to write to them of righteousness, then they too could go through anything Satan would send their way. And so we see Paul and his encouragement and his strength suffering for Christ and doing so rejoicing, knowing that it will benefit those who know him in his walk with God. As we see with Paul, Jesus' sacrificial service also demanded of him doing his share. When we look at the Bible and we examine the Bible, we see we all have a great responsibility. We all have that which we are to do that is our part, don't we? We are to fulfill our responsibility, in other words, and that's found throughout the Scriptures. God has always demanded throughout the pages of time that his people do what is expected of them, do their part, in other words, as his children. Paul understood this better than anybody, didn't he? Having been against God and then for God, having gone through all the things in which he has done, Paul understood that most, in fact all of us, as we read and see what he wrote, that we have our duty upon us. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, let's look at the rest of it now. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh notice I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. 
Now, the New American Standard more fully develops what Paul is getting at here. Look at the New American Standard in Colossians 1.24. Now, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now, I do my share in filling up. That's the same Greek word. All they're doing is trying to explain, demonstrate, and show what Paul is talking about here, what Paul is looking at here. Now, let's keep in mind something. As we said, Paul's in prison, but why is he in prison? Well, if we remember back in Acts chapter 21, Paul, having gone back after doing his missionary journeys, he goes back to Jerusalem, doesn't he? And while he is there, James, the brother of Christ, asks him, says, listen, we got some brethren who need, I need your help with. And so will you go with them and into the temple and do some Jewish rituals with them Go into the temple, pay for them, because there's a great number of people who think you love the Gentiles far more than the Jews. And so Paul says, listen, to, con to keep peace, I'll do this. But in Acts chapter 21, 27 through 29, it didn't matter that he only went in with Jews to help with this, who are Jewish Christians, by the way. Because he had been seen with Gentiles there in Jerusalem, the people, the Jews, uproared against him and said he brought Gentiles into the temple. Paul was thrown into prison because the Jews knew he taught the uncircumcision in Christ could stay uncircumcised. He taught that the Gentiles, in other words, were a part of the mystery of God that had now been revealed that they were to be in the church. What does that have to do with what Paul is writing here? What's that have to do with his keeping up with his share in helping the Colossians, who, by the way, were Gentiles, most of them, Paul is telling the church in Colossae that he is doing his share or filling up what is lacking for the cause of Christ and thus being an example for them. That he is willing to take on the bonds of prison. He's willing to take on chains so that they can understand their importance in the church. That God hasn't left them out. The mystery has been revealed. The gospel is for all. He's done his part. He's demonstrated. In fact, he is in prison for them the Gentiles. He's doing what he is supposed to be doing. If Paul was willing to go to prison to do his share, then how much more are we to do? How much more should we who know that really, especially in our lifetime, in our situation, at least what we're in now, prison is very unlikely. If Paul was willing for the church to do whatever it took to get the gospel proclaimed, even going to prison, we should do our share as well. I'm reminded when I think of this idea, the song we oftentimes sing, None of Self and All of Thee. And in that song, we see the progression of maturity that should be in each of us as we begin as babes in Christ and work our way to that maturity of God. When we think of the chorus, it begins with all of self and none of thee. Everything's about me. Everything's about what I want, not what God wants, but what I want. And then it turns to some of self and some of thee. And so as one matures, they start realizing, recognizing, and seeing the need to do more, to do their share, to be what God would have them to be more and more. Then the song progresses to less of self and more of thee. Then the fourth and final verse there we see in the book, it says, none of self and all of thee. What's it talking about? Doing our share. God expects us to do what we're supposed to do, to recognize it's not about what we want, but what God wants. This reminds me of the book of Ecclesiastes. <coughs> when I think of that song and I think of what Paul is talking about, doing what he has done for the Gentiles, what Solomon would say, after doing all these great things the world would seek and find is amazing, doing all these things his way, he then says at the end there in chapter 12, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Some translations put this is the duty of man. That's not the case. It's talking about who he is as a person. We are created in the image of God to 
keep his commandments and fear God. It is our all. It is our essence. It ought to be our nature. In other words, we are created for good works in such manners. In other words, we are to do our share. We are to seek righteousness and truth for the supreme Christ. But we're also, as we look at what Paul reveals concerning the necessity of this sacrificial service, the demands that our supreme Savior puts on him, and thus we learn in ourselves we see also demands of ministry of Paul. Now there's something interesting here when it comes to the word ministry. Many times, because of the way it's translated in our Bibles, we think of it as just simply that which a preacher is. I know of a preacher one time at a lectureship where there were several hundred people there. And he asked, as he looked across and he saw all these people, he said, I want everyone who's a minister to stand up. And about 15 or 20 men stood up. He said, okay, sit down. He said, now I want you to hear me again. He said, I want every single minister here to stand up. Again, he got a few more that time. Some older men stood up. He said, and they all sat down. He said a third time. He said, I don't think you quite heard me. He said, I want everyone here who's a minister to stand up. He said, he looked at all the confusion across there. It's sad to realize none of them realized they were all ministers. We've somehow conveyed this word into that which is a preacher only. Preachers are no doubt ministers, but so is everyone else. Paul would declare this in Colossians 1, 24 and 25. I want to put these together. So I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. When it comes to the word minister, it's an interesting word because this is the same word that is most often translated servant. It's also the same word we find for deacon. As most of us know, the word deacon just simply means servants, the word diakonos. When we see it in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we realize it's talking about the position or the office of deacon, and hence its transliteration there. But most of the time in the Bible, where it's translated, it's translated servant. For some reason, and I have yet to figure out the reason why, for some reason there became a trend when it comes to preacher, we're going to switch that word servant to just simply minister. And that's caused a lot of confusion. It's caused people to think that ministry is that which only a preacher does or those with this title, that somehow it's a title. But the word just simply means servant. This same word is found there in John 12 and 26. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will be, notice, my servant, my minister, be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. In Romans chapter 16, verse 1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a minister or servant of the church at Chinchuria. What does that tell us? That tells us everyone is a minister. Our supreme savior demands our sacrificial service in ministry or servanthood. He expects everyone who has obeyed his gospel plan of salvation to be a servant of his, to serve him and those others around them. In other words, Paul, as he led us in song, is a song leading minister. Everyone who teaches class here, whether it be the kids or up here or wherever the case may be, they are ministers of Bible class. The one who sits back there and greets others and encourages them. They're a servant of encouragement, a minister in encouragement. Our preeminent Savior and King demands sacrificial service and ministry. And every single one of us, like Paul, are ministers. Paul wasn't declaring himself some special preacher. This minister preacher, he was saying, as a preacher, I am a servant to those in whom I have the blessing and opportunity to preach the gospel to, to let them know and be fully known the word of God. We also then continue to see that Paul, talking about the supreme or preeminent Savior and King demand of sacrificial service in teaching. He would say concerning teaching that he must proclaim, doesn't he? that he must proclaim. And when we look at this idea of proclaiming and teaching, 
Proclaiming God has always had a goal, hasn't it? It's always had that which looks forward. In fact, the word proclaim here, or preach in some translations, literally means to do public proclamation. It's not private and in the home. This is dealing with, and hence the word preaching in some translations, but it's dealing with proclaiming the word out publicly. Public preaching, public teaching of God's word must always have a goal. If anyone in Bible class, from the pulpit, out in the world, whether it be at the post office or at the mini mart or wherever the case may be, if any of us are proclaiming the gospel, we must be doing it with purpose in mind. Paul talks about this purpose, doesn't he? Colossians 1.28. Him we proclaim, notice, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Now he's dealing specifically with the church. There's no doubt about that. When we look at this idea of presenting everyone mature to Christ, and what he's talking about is, listen, as proclaimers of God's word, as teachers of God's word, as that which we are ministers of when we do that, serving the congregation, serving those around us, we must have a goal in that proclamation. We must have a, a desire to reach people in a certain way. The goal of every public proclamation of God's word is to warn against sin and teach God's word the wisdom of God. It's to warn against sin and teach the word of God, which is the wisdom of God, so that everyone matures to know the difference between good and evil, Hebrews chapter 5, 14. That they learn to mature, that they can understand, as we talked this morning, about good and evil, righteousness and sin. Brothers and sisters, this sacrificial service that God demands of preachers, he demands of everyone, doesn't he? Everyone who's going to proclaim that must make sure they understand what their role is. In teaching God's word, we warn and we teach. We exhort and we rebuke where necessary. Teaching God's word is just that. It's learning the difference between good and evil, righteousness and sin. I'm reminded of what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2 there. We all know that. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men. And once again, that word men there is anthropos, men and women, meaning mankind. Trust to faithful mankind, men and women who will be able to teach others also. The only way someone can go from being taught to teaching is if they mature as they should. And when we proclaim the word as is our service, when we teach God's word as which is expected of us from our preeminent Savior, we must proclaim, we must preach, we must teach in public and in all other manners that which is God's word and his word only. Our preeminent Savior demands sacrificial service from all of us concerning teaching his word to the world. He also demands, lastly, a sacrificial service, as Paul points out, in laboring. When we think of the word labor or working, we're thinking of this idea of doing what God would have us do. And when we think of working for God, I don't know about you, but I don't think there's any greater job than that. That doesn't mean I'm always great at it. It doesn't mean I'm all, even always excited about some of the labor and some of the things in which you're involved in that sacrificial service to God, that ministry, in other words, to God. But it is the greatest job one could ever have. The reason one should want to become a child of God and have their sins washed away is because they become a part of the church, the glorious church of Christ. And then they get the opportunity to work for God. Can't we hear Paul here talking about this in this way in Colossians chapter 1 verse 21, 29 when he says, for which purpose also I labor, striving according to his working, which is at work powerfully in me. Paul says, listen, I purpose to labor. It is my goal, my desire, my want. I'm willing to sacrifice and serve willingly. I'm willing to labor for God according to his working, the way in which he wants it done, because he's going to work through me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Brothers and sisters, we were not created in Christ to be in we were not created in Christ to not labor, 
for the sake of Christ. We were created in Christ for good works, Ephesians 2 and verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. It's not a matter of just getting through the day. It's a matter of going through the day for Christ. It's a matter of understanding that we literally, God did what he did and, and created us a new creation for his workmanship. We are his beautifully bound laborers. And that's not a bad thing. You know, the old saying that goes, if you find a job you like, you'll never work a day in your life. We've all heard that. When it comes to walking with God and working with Him, laboring with Him every day is not a day in which we struggle with our labor. It's a day we get to work with our Lord and Savior. We are to labor out our own salvation, Philippians 2 and verse 12. We are to labor in faith, James 2 and 17. We are to labor for the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. We are His workmanship. We were created for laboring or working for God. When we think of the preeminent Savior, Jesus Christ, our Messiah, and our King and Lord. When we think of our super, superior Savior, excuse me, we see through Paul the things in which he demonstrates that he does demand a great deal of us. That God demanded a great deal of himself in sending his only begotten Son to live a perfect life, to learn obedience here on earth, to become the man Christ Jesus forevermore. He went through all that, redeeming the soul of man through his blood. He labored extremely hard for us. He sacrificed a ton for us. And in that, he demands that we become a living sacrifice for him. If we make that commitment to our Savior, to have our sins washed away, if we tell him and give him our oath, our promise that, listen, if you wash away my sins, I will work for you. That's the, the oath, the promise, the commitment we make to have our sins washed away. I will give my all. I will be that disciple. I will take up my cross daily. When we make that commitment, we understand what we are getting into or should. That is a work for us. A workforce for Christ that all may see the beauty of what he has done and who he is. That we may be that bright and shining labor force for our God that he has reflected in us. Let us be what God would have us be. This evening as we reflect upon your sacrificial services to God. I pray as you look at your life and examine your life that you are being what you ought to be. But all of us, I would surmise could reflect back, look back, and see where there are areas where we can mature and we can improve. And as we look at that and as we focus on that, let us never forget why we ought to be doing that. Jesus did come to this earth. He emptied himself, gave up so much for you and I. The people who had separated ourselves from him in sin had sacrificed, really, the righteousness of God for the fleeting pleasures of sin. He did all that for you and I. Why do we wake up each morning a morning that was not promised and desire to work for him, to learn his will, to draw closer to him and to help others see that truth, that greatness, the labor force of righteousness, the best life possible here on earth? Why do we do that? Because he is our God who loves us, cares for us. This evening, if there's someone here who maybe realizes they haven't quite been living up to what they ought to be, don't fear. We all, as we talked about this morning in class, we all go through ups and downs. The question isn't whether or not we're going to go through those downs. The question is how do we react to them? When we realize them and when we see them, do we seek to change that? Do we seek to improve our faith? Do we seek to improve our life with God and draw closer to Him? Or do we continue down that path, continue to get worse and worse? I know the people here and I know each of you here and I know you want to that of righteousness, but maybe there's someone here tonight struggling. Maybe there's someone we don't know of who's dealing with this and they're struggling with that downward spiral that can catch us off guard if we're not careful and we can sometimes not know how to get back up. 
If there's someone here tonight dealing with that, let us know. Maybe you're not quite down to the bottom, but you can feel yourself going that way. Stop. Let us help. Don't go out those doors. Let the family of God here put arms around you, strengthen you and encourage you, and bring you back into the fold. A laborer who will help us then in return when we need that help, and we will. We all do. So this evening, if there's someone here who needs the prayers of this congregation, the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ tonight, let us know by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.